Hello, everybody, and welcome to Where Are They Now in Sports. This is brought to you by Malibu Clothes. Get your suits right here at the Malibu Clothes Building in Beverly Hills. And if you're not in the area, all you have to do is go to www.malibuclothesbh.com. That's where I'm going. I need some <laughs> new clothes. That's ridiculous. Today's guest is a former UFC fighter. That's right, UFC. They, these guys don't mess around. Please welcome Nate Rock Quarry. Thank you very much. It's very true. We do not mess around, so please be kind. Yes. <laughs> so before we talk about what are you doing now with your life, um, let's talk about your journey. What yeah. made you get involved in UFC? Like, how did that start? <clears throat> well, it was, geez, from a very very early age. I was raised in a very strict religious background, a cult of Jehovah's Witnesses. And so <clears throat> being strict JWs, my parents would not allow me to participate in any sports whatsoever. So I remember being 12, 13 years old in middle school and my heart just breaking as I'm seeing the kids that I knew starting to wrestle and starting to play football. And I was the skinniest, little, nerdiest little kid with big, thick glasses, hair party down the middle. And I was like, I know I could do that if I just had the chance. But it was just an impossibility. If I would have told my father I wanted to do that, it would have been hell raining down on me in modern times. So when I started fighting, it was I wanted to know what kind of a man I was. Am I the type of guy that's going to get hit once and run away? And I've seen it in the UFC. Guys get hit and literally run away tapping as they're going. Or will I be the type of guy that will fight till I have absolutely nothing left and you'll have to kill me? When you were a kid, like, you see your friends playing Little League. You see the, all these, uh, you know, teenagers, especially in your teens, playing high school sports. How did you feel about parents telling you, no, you can't play. You got to stay with your whole witness. I mean... Didn't that hurt you so much? And what made you get out of it? What made you say enough's enough? Because you started at 24 years old, right? I was at a party and this guy comes up to me and he goes, dude, there's these two guys beating the hell out of each other in a cage. And I thought to myself, who would do that? And then I go inside and I see Hoyce and Ken going at it. And I was like, holy crap, these guys are skilled. They know what they're doing. They're athletes. And then look at the respect that they show each other afterwards. I went home and I opened up the phone book and I said, I am miserable. I hate my life. I hate my job. I hate this church that I'm supposed to be going to and, and doing all of their ridiculous rules. I can't celebrate birthdays, Christmas. I can't talk to my sister because she was kicked out of the church. I'm miserable. And if giving up all of that, if losing all my childhood friends and my family means that I get to follow my dreams for the first time in my life, then that's what I'll do. So now, how do, how do, what does it take to get a, a UFC card? Am I correct about that? As far as, you know, what are the, what's the journey, the steps? Obviously, you have to go to a, a camp. Yeah, so, you know, what's really funny is fighting in the UFC is the easiest professional sport to get into in the world. They have a link on their website, at least they used to, I think they still do, do you think you're tough enough to fight in the UFC? Send in a tape. And then they review the tapes. They see who you fought. And if they like you, they'll give you a call. You'll fight on a, a small show, a Facebook fight, something like that. If you do well, well, then maybe you'll get a three-fight contract or something like that. When you got to the camp, or am I skipping steps? So when you got there, when you saw the ad, then what? Well, we did an hour and a half of kickboxing. I had no idea what I was doing. And now I'm getting this opportunity. And even with the jujitsu, I had no clue what I was doing. The guys were taking my back and choking me out. I, would, I was that guy. I got a phone call from my parents in early summer that my father had been diagnosed with a disease that his bone marrow quit producing red blood cells. So as we got close to the time, I think it was November, even though I was still kicked out of the church, I was the one kid that was able to go and help them. In November, I go to be with my mother and father. And when I show up, he's just kind of tired. But as the days go along, his red blood cells quit replenishing and he starts to slowly pass. And 
the worst part of the whole journey was I'd be sleeping at 2 a.m. My mother would bust the door open. My father tried to get up to go to the bathroom. Well, the blood would rush to his muscles and he would pass out. So now we've got this 250-pound grown man, my father, laying on the floor unconscious. And my mother's running around screaming and crying. And I'm having to take a deep breath and squat down and pick him up because we're thinking, do we have to call an ambulance to come out here? And it's just etched in my memory, my mother sitting above my father, screaming his name, begging him to wake up. And as the weeks went along, it got to the point where I realized there wasn't a whole lot more that I could do. His passing was coming. And I told my mother, I've, I've contracted to take a fight a couple months ago in Richmond, Virginia. <clears throat> I said, what do you think about that? And now she looks at me and says, if you said you were going to do something, you should do it. So I went into the room and I kissed my father goodbye. And I told him that I always loved him no matter what he did. And I had previously told him he, he wanted to apologize for a lot of the things that had gone on in my childhood. And I looked at him and I said, you're my father. I'm not going to let you sit here and badmouth my father. And I forgave him and he had a sigh of relief. And now I was there telling my father goodbye and that I loved him. And he, he told me that he always loved me. And I flew off to Richmond, Virginia with Randy Couture. And I get a, a phone call from my sister and she passes it off to my mother that my father had just passed away while I was there cutting weight. And I <clears throat> got back to the hotel room and I told Randy what had happened. And he said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, I came here to fight. I always knew that this was a possibility. I said goodbye to my father before I left. This is a roundabout way leading to how I got to the UFC. So... <clears throat> I'm then running around the cage, screaming like a madman, feeling this huge relief that this fight that I was worried about, and now my father has passed and, and all of this. Up comes to the ring to shake my hand, Joe Silva, the matchmaker for the UFC. He lives in Richmond, Virginia. I made the decision to fulfill my contract to keep my word, say goodbye to my father and go fight, and Joe Silva was there in the ring. So a few months later, <clears throat> I get this phone call from Joe Silva saying, we're doing this reality show based on the UFC. We want you to come down and try out for it. They asked me, how much would it mean to you to be the ultimate fighter? And I looked at him and I said, you could break a baseball bat over my head. I would take the jagged end and stab you through the heart if that's what it took to win the title. And they were like, oh, man, this is good stuff. I love this guy. So once you got the gig, obviously you did great. But then you, uh, you had an injury. You hurt your ankle, and then you became actually a coach, and they loved you for that. Talk to me about it. Uh, boy, it was one of those, just one of those classic Corey moments where I'm like doing my own thing. I'm off boxing with Peter Welch and, and training with him, and we're going really slow because Pete doesn't know a lot of MMA, and I think he respected my knowledge of where I've come from. <clears throat> So we're just working, and I'm like, yeah, if you slip here, I'm going to throw a knee here. And then all of a sudden, I get hit by 420 pounds in motion, and it snaps my left ankle, and I just drop. And I'm hobbling outside trying to get to the hospital, and the, the producer looks at me and he goes, you just got injured. Tell us how you feel. <laughs> and I look at him, and I go, I'm currently seeing all my dreams die. How the bleep do you think I feel? Put me in the bleeping ambulance and get me out of here. During that, do you feel like that gave you an opportunity to become involved in UFC as far as you became the coach in the reality show and they, they liked you a lot, I could imagine. Well, it was what was interesting was... The day that Dana came out and gave the big speech, do you want to be a fighter? And then they call me in the back room when they got the results back from the doctor and they said, you have to have surgery. We're going to have to take you out of competition. And I started crying right there. I was like, I, not only am I now out of the competition, I have to have surgery. And she says, but you don't understand. It, you know, America's going to love you. You're, we're going to keep you on as a coach. And I was like, that's not where I want to be. So your first fight, okay, your first UFC fight was against Drew McFedris, is that? No, my first UFC fight was against Logan Sincade. I fought Drew McFedris 
That's every one of my fights is a good story. I fought Drew McFedries in a smaller show, I think, in Idaho. And one of my favorite highlights of all time was Drew hit me with a straight left cross right in the center of my face. And my whole head and body whips back, and I come back with a right hand and just blast him. And the fight ends in the second round with Drew falling out of the ropes, and I'm trying to pull him back in to beat on him some more. When you... Give me the schedule. Let's say you're scheduled for a UFC match. Uh, you know, is it like three months before the match? How does it work? It generally is. Now it is because it's, they got a lot more fighters, but a lot more shows, and it's a lot more professionally run. My first run in the UFC, I fought four times in seven and a half months. Okay. So I was fighting once every seven weeks. Once every seven weeks. Now tell me about the training. You, you know, you're scheduled for a fight seven weeks before, right? Let's say what you just said. Give me the training. Monday starts. What happens? How long is the training? It's, uh, it, it was generally a six, day, six days a week process for me. Uh, I would have, because being 24, I had no background in any sports whatsoever. So I needed to learn boxing. That's why my head movement is so bad. I needed to learn kickboxing. That's why my hips are so tight. I needed to learn jujitsu. I needed to do conditioning because when I met Randy, I could not spar for five minutes. I was in such bad shape. One day, how many hours you put in? You said six days a week. How many hours you put in that one day? Practices usually about an hour and a half, maybe two. <clears throat> I find I start to burn out after an hour or so because it's intensity. It's not volume. When you guys look at each other in the way in, <clears throat> is it like, yo, I'm gonna, I'm gonna destroy you? I mean, do you get intimidated? Do some will. Uh, Jorge Rivera in my last fight just said we're gonna have some fun tomorrow night, and I was so dehydrated I couldn't even understand him. And I just looked at him and went, "Thank you." Now, when you're on the ring, <clears throat> sorry, not the ring. When you're in the cage, do you guys talk some smack against each other? Like, oh, that didn't hurt me. Like, <clears throat> is any like, oh, you punch your punches are weak. Like, do you talk like that? <laughs> I never have because I don't want to make my opponent angrier than he already is. I said one negative thing in my whole career about Rich Franklin. I said, he's got a weak chin, I've got heavy hands. And he told me afterwards that motivated him so much to beat me down, which he did. My knockout, the receiving end of that knockout is still shown before every UFC pay-per-view. Every time they show anything UFC, it's me getting knocked out, falling like a tree. How, do, how does a UFC, get, uh, UFC fighter get paid? Is it from promoters? Well, you got to remember, and I'm sure that this will be taken out of context by someone, and it will get back to me that I'm ungrateful for everything, which is not the case. I'm incredibly grateful, and especially for the, my payment in my last few fights. The UFC is going to pay you. When I first started fighting for them, they paid me $5,000 to show up, $5,000 if I won. So I have an opportunity to make ten grand. My first stint in the UFC, I fought four times. I made $40,000 for the year. You take away 15% for training fees and other coaches that I was paying out of my pocket and then taxes, I'm living at basically the poverty level trying to get my little girl to go to college and, and not be like me. So we would get any sponsor that would put their, their logo on us. I would really anything that anybody wanted. I'd like, man, I'm going to represent your brand well. I'm never going to be disgraceful. I'm going to do the best that I possibly can. And sometimes... I got uh, my comeback fight against Pete Sell. I was sponsored by Toyo Tires. They gave me a set of tires. So that's like $400, and I had to have Toyo Tires on my gear for two fights. So I'm basically getting $200 a fight for this sponsor. But I was so broke, I was rolling around on, on the treads on my tire, and one of them was my spare tire. And... And as a, as you become a, of a bigger name in UFC, do they give you a raise, or is it just still the same fee, five thousand dollars? It was five and five for my first three fights, and then when I fought for the title, I got a jump up to ten and ten. But since I lost the fight, I made ten thousand dollars for my UFC title fight main event at the MGM Grand. It was the third highest gate in UFC history at the time. I would have appreciated a little bit more money, but the backstory to that is. Shortly after that, I was diagnosed with degenerative disc disease and needed to get an X-lift spinal fusion. And 
I went to Dana White and I said, I can't train anymore. I'm in so much pain. I don't, and I don't know what to do. And Dana said, go to the doctor, get it checked out. We'll take care of it. And he not only paid for my surgery, I believe he paid for my flight down to Vegas and paid for my hotel room for three weeks while I was recovering. So here's the biggest question. What are you doing now? We know your history. <clears throat> what are you doing now with your life? So getting up to the Pete Cell fight, I called call Joe Silva, and no one thought it was possible. You can't have back surgery and return to fighting. I called Joe, and I said, Joe, I'm ready. And Joe wanted me to fight Pete Sell. And I'd, I'd before said, dude, Pete Sell is way too tough. I'm coming back after a 22-month layoff. I need somebody that I feel I can beat a little easier. Well, now he's like, I don't got anybody else. And I went, all right, <clears throat> I'll fight Pete. It's going to be hell, but I'll fight Pete. So I go out there, and I'm fighting, and he's just beating the hell out of me. And the second round, he hits me with a right hand right on the jaw and drops me. And I remember thinking, if I don't stop him here, all my dreams die. I won't be able to feed my daughter. You're going to beat him now. And I flew in and landed a final right hand. And the referee jumped in and stopped it. And I ran around the ring screaming, I'm back. This is what you came to see. I'm not going anywhere. So once my checks had cleared, <clears throat> I went back and picked up my daughter again from, from school or daycare. And... I took her to the mall and I got down on my knees and I looked at her and I said, since we started this crazy journey, we have lived on nothing for the past five, six years and you have never complained once. You're now going to go into that store and buy whatever you want. And her eyes got real big and she said, really? And I said, yes. And so we go in there and the first thing she grabs is a, a shirt with a big lion on it. She goes, daddy, daddy, how much is this? That's my girl asking how much things cost. And I said, it doesn't matter. Whatever you want, you get. And for all my bravado, it was barely over a hundred dollars. But it was just it was just a reminder. This is why I do this. I'm not doing this for, for personal fame. I'm not doing this for glory. I'm doing this to give my daughter the childhood that I never had. And now she goes to the best school in the state and she gets straight A's and she gets to ride horses as her reward. And that, all the beatings, all the surgeries, they all fade away when I think about her. <clears throat> what are you doing now after your career was over? You know, as far as right now, this is what the show's all about. The journey <laughs> and what are you doing now? <laughs> so this was all a lead up to the big question. Uh, <clears throat> well, now I, I have my daughter. She goes to school out of my house. She goes to her mother's on the weekend. So that's, that's the biggest thing. That's my, my main priority, making sure she gets to school and takes care of her responsibilities. Then I work with the company that, that gave me my life back, Nuvasiv, gave me the back surgery that allowed me to compete again. Yeah, that's awesome. So, and then on top of that, my other big passion project was I wanted to write a biography, and I still do, like, like a, a fairly legitimate biography of my journey, and I'm just not somebody who can sit down for hours and type. So I definitely would at some point want to find somebody to help me with that. But everyone had been bugging me to write a biography and I didn't want to write the same old Rocky story. So I sat down and I started writing my journey, but then I put in zombies as the antagonist. So it's called zombie cage fighter. And it's really, it's the story of my life with a couple exceptions, the pizza comeback fight I lost and I never really got back on my feet again. And now I'm old and washed up and broken down and I'm looking at my little girl who I've got in a bad neighborhood going to a bad school and I, all I want to do is what I've ever wanted, just to give her a better life than me. And after a good beat down, <clears throat> I get introduced to the underground zombie cage fights where if you do well, you can make enough money to maybe change your, your position in life, change your, your little girl's future. But if you lose, then the next week you're on the rotten side of the cage. So I sat down and started writing it. I made the, uh, the first comic book, which just came out phenomenally. I had a great writer to help me put my chicken scratch into word bubbles, a great artist, and I actually have it digitally available on my website, zombiecagefighter.com, for a penny right now. The hard copies are still available for $3 each, and I've got a whole bunch of shirts, about a dozen different shirts. Fighting has given me almost everything in my life. All my friends, my possessions, 
it's all due to fighting. It's a big part of it's all due to the UFC. If there was a biography about you <laughs> and someone, you know, and and they had to hire an actor and it, you call the shots, which actor would you hire to play Nate Corey? What would be perfect would be either Jason Statham because he's got the athleticism, but he ha- he looks so cool all the time. He would need to be able to look beaten down and just tired. Like all your dreams, everything that you've tried has died. And now here you are getting one final chance to try and feed your little girl and make sure she doesn't end up like you. You have to have that look of defeat and desperation. Yeah. Well, you know, Nate, it's been a great conversation <laughs> with you. I learned a lot. I, you know, I actually do CrossFit workouts and my endurance is kind of weak and I'm like, man, so I'm going <laughs> to think about you. <laughs> like, Nate said, take, take, take jujitsu. Jiu-